Again, my name is David Moore, and I've worked as part of the team over the last year and a half on the process that led to the roadmap. And I just want to sort of use the next 15 or 20 minutes to make sure you understand how that came about and what's in it. And in a few minutes, some colleagues um, who've been part of the process and who are committed to helping take the next step and start the action planning um, and the action efforts will join me up here and we'll have a conversation with them about what happens and then give you a chance um, to meet with folks and, and choose your own pathways forward. Um, I want to just sort of remind you sort of many of you have been a part of this journey. Um, we've been twice in this room and in other rooms here at the Keter Center and around this community in a variety of different kinds of meetings and efforts. There's been a steering committee. We did some deep dives into data and research about the challenges of poverty in your region. We did direct community engagement with families living in poverty around the Stone and Taney County region. Um, the team, as you heard earlier, made site visits to other communities. We held large group and small group planning sessions, both about what are the biggest barriers and challenges facing people in poverty, as well as then on particular challenges and barriers, what might we do to address those barriers. All of those efforts have culminated in this initial um, stake in the ground, a roadmap that says we have identified some things we can do and should start to do, and we have to continue to work together with a model of collective impact that can keep us moving forward. So I just want to sort of capture some of the key points that are here for you. Many of these come directly out of the roadmap you have in front of you. You'll see some of the same graphics, but I want to make sure we're all on the same page about where that came from. This is a picture you've seen before. We updated a couple of the data points um, to give you a sense of the size and scale of poverty in the region. Um, and that's 85,000 people in the region, 15% poverty rate. You're slightly higher than the, the state and the nation, but not dramatically so. Um, one of the other findings that I, I'm reminded of in the research is that you actually don't have a high unemployment rate in the region. Most of the folks who are poor, classified as poverty, actually work. Um, they have jobs. Um, they just don't make enough to qualify above the poverty line. And as we talked with folks, we heard about the challenges facing them, housing, transportation, childcare, the nature and type of jobs that are actually available to them, um, and how to sustain all of that over time for themselves. All of that's led to an agenda to get us started. And I want to take a minute just to be really clear on this opening page. There's a fundamental goal that's driven the work, and we figured out how to say it in a really concise way. It's to move people out of poverty by becoming a community that puts our caring into action. Right? This is that Bible doing quote. Right? We, we say we care. Let's put it into action. Let's help people transition out. And a couple of fundamental values that the, the team really wanted to sort of be very explicit about, right? We're committed to addressing personal and collective challenges to keeping individuals and families, that keep individuals and families in poverty. We are guided by faith and the example of Jesus Christ in our work while humbly learning from and serving those most in need. We've identified some initial goal areas and want to make progress. And we're gonna to continue to expand our programmatic efforts in support of the overall goal and these collective efforts. And what's that last bullet mean? One of the things we kept talking about was this isn't about telling somebody to slow down the work they already do that's serving families and serving people challenged with poverty. In fact, it should give fuel to people doing their work while we sort of connect it and grow our ability to serve those, those, those ideas. The first goal area that emerged came directly out of the conversations we had had with families around the community, and it became its own goal called mobilizing a caring community. And there was a, there was a real imbalance in conversations. Lots of folks talked about sort of the value and the appreciation they got from faith-based services and church. But there were also comments from folks about feeling judged um, and feeling unwelcome uh, in places in their community about who they were and how they looked. Um, and the folks in the planning groups and on the steering committee um, were challenged by that, that that's not exactly, exa not exactly, not at all how we want to be perceived um, 
from our faith-based perspectives, and we have to sort of wrestle with what does it mean to do that work in a different kind of way that will move us forward. And so some of the specific strategies that this group is gonna pick up and work on are gonna be about how do we better network between and amongst churches to collaborate on some programming and supports so that we're not all separately doing work. How do we expand our efforts to be welcoming of those of poverty with mentoring support and assistance in our church communities? Can we do a better job utilizing the church and faith communities to create community-wide communication about resources and volunteer opportunities, that those opportunities are fragmented and disconnected, and in fact, um, we can mobilize better awareness? And lastly, can we expand the church-based life skills and emergency assistance programs that we know are high quality but are constrained by resources, both human and financial capacities? So that's goal number one in the roadmap. And we'll hear a little bit more about that in a little while. Goal number two is really emerged around the livable wage jobs. And you heard me make the comment in the data about you don't have a high unemployment rate, but you have um, an inability to make a living wage income in the overall economic structure of your community. Um, I was just uh, sharing a conversation about this. Um, it's not unique to Branton. It's, a, it's part of the challenge of the larger American economy right now. But um, it is exacerbated by your both seasonal and service-based economy. And so you see here sort of where the wages are for workers and what it takes to live and support a family. And, and how do we think about our efforts to create jobs in a region that can do more to create more opportunities for people to sustain themselves and their families? And so we've identified some initial strategies to work on this. Increasing the number of jobs with sustainable wages where employee, employer, and customer all win. Um, the first is really the Taney County Partnership is going to help drive this work with us as agreed to help host the ongoing conversations. One of the strategies that was identified early on was how well are we doing at identifying and supporting the homegrown businesses? Um, and Elizabeth gets credit for making us think about this. Elizabeth Hughes down here front, it's great to have back in the room, that there are people doing things to supplement their income in their garages, making crafts, building things, supporting things. Um, it's actually become a rural economic development strategy around the country is to look at the people who are already doing small startup businesses and use them to expand and grow uh, a homegrown non-seasonal sector. Create outreach efforts and collaboration among human resource officers to learn about second chance hiring, bonding, and other strategies to expand employment. There are barriers around um, those who've been um, incarcerated or faced other barriers. There are strategies to alleviate that and to actually have outside insurance for those folks. Um, how do we work with HR departments to better address those? Leverage existing training programs to partner directly with employers to tie training straight to a job. Um, the evidence around job training is that um, if employers understand that there's a pipeline ready made for them, it actually strengthens the ability of the sector to employ folks. And lastly, there are companies in your community who have intentionally on their own made the choice to drive livable wages and benefits. And there's some of this can be, we can be highlighting those folks and helping learn from companies in town that have already done that to translate to other folks. Goal number three is around transportation. Transportation is one of the fundamental barriers we heard about over and over and over again. 50% um, of living expenses are housing and transportation in the region. Um, we're going to get to housing in a minute. It's fundamental. But transportation um, gets in the way right away for almost everyone. It's stable, it's reliable, it's predictable transportation. Um, and it's layered, right? In the city, it's not enough of the right kind of public transportation. In more rural areas, it's the cost of gas, it's the cost of operating and maintaining a car. Um, the distance traveled often outweigh the short shifts that people get on the job, and how do we sort of navigate those pieces? So you'll see some initial strategies this group is committed to working on. One is we have to actually have a regional conversation about a transportation plan. Um, to the extent you can engage government and state government on public resources for public transportation, you have to have a coordinated approach. So there needs to be an effort on that front. In the meantime, we can do some really specific things. Elevate Branson has had a pilot 
bike sharing program in the past with great data about the utilization of bikes for folks to get around, we could restart that with resources and support to create transportation options. Um, we can expand offerings of the garage ministries or others around car repair, car ownership, to make sure folks can keep their cars um, reliable and safe. Um, we can expand, the, we can at least consider the options to expand OATS or other service transportations, and we've got to increase the awareness. There's some sense that we actually have underutilized um, in the lower in wage worker sector of transportation options that are available in the community. And what have we done to sort of make those available and well known to folks? Again, some very specific things that can be worked on with both long term and short term um, perspectives. Goal four housing. As you heard Susan say, this planning team recognized right from the start that. If we're gonna help folks transition out of um, low wage poverty challenges, they have to have stable, reliable, quality housing. Um, it's a turnkey, excuse the pun, um, trajectory to lots of other improvements that lets people stabilize education, job, healthcare, a whole bunch of other things. Um, the challenges of housing in the region are well known. Um, we anchored a lot of the conversations in the work of the housing study for Taney County that sort of was very clear about both the challenges of development, rehab, um, and the gaps in affordable housing for the region. A need to sort of take that plan and have a more broad-based working group to really start to tackle some of the specific things. One of the important things we have to do really clearly is take the inventory of housing, uh, of land that was in that, and really start to talk about what part of that inventory is available for affordable housing development. Um, one of your challenges, you know, is that not every piece of open land is easily put a building on. Um, so how do we get that and how do we navigate the costs related to development? Um, tied to that is one of the things that's been successful in other communities is that you can create funding pools to share risk. And how do you create um, some options to share the risk between developers, residents, and the public sector to allow for an increase in stable and affordable housing? And then, then lastly, we need to do a better job of the rehab of existing housing. There's an um, unfortunate large supply of really low quality housing. Um, and I don't mean just the hotels, like individual houses, especially in the rural areas. Um, and it, this is actually both a, uh, a housing strategy and an economic development and skills strategy. More contractors licensed and resources to rehab and help houses is good on lots of levels. Um, and it's a strategy that's worth digging in on. So you see the housing group has some immediate things to do. Um, and there's a, there's a lot of great actors in this space in your community. Um, so this is one of those perfect examples of the power of collective efforts to take those good things and pull them together in a different direction. And our, the fifth goal identified is really around individual skills and training for folks who are in the workforce so that we can give people a pathway to higher paying jobs. And I just want to sort of comment really quick here. You'll note that sort of goal two around jobs and goal five around skills relate together, right? The labor market is a supply and demand equation. And if we're going to, we have to be careful. Like if we give everybody, you know, certifications in how to be a, a, a computer programmer and have no computer programming jobs, we really won't have done ourselves any good as a community. Right? So we've got to match up the two parts of the equation, um, but they are separate issues and that's why they stayed as separate goal areas. Um, one of the challenges here is that people are, are in low skill jobs, um, they're in, working two and three jobs, so we have constraints on their time, on their hours, and we have to find new ways and different ways to help lift up skills and opportunities for folks. So we've got programs already in place like Jobs for Life at Elevate Branson that um, we, we could expand. There's no reason those programs can't reach more people. They're limited only by some basic human mentoring volunteers and resource investments, but they're highly successful and well known as such. Um, we need to expand training programs tied to your existing travel and tourism industry. Like are we helping people not just walk through the front door and have an entry level job, but see actually the travel and tourism industry as a career trajectory? And how do we help people who are in those jobs see the levels that they can transition up in that sector? Train and support residents to start their own businesses, right? One of the best strategies for economic development 
in a place like Branson is in fact homegrown entrepreneurship. It's pretty hard to bring really big businesses into small places. That's not the pattern of today's economy. But so smaller and mid-sized places are building their own homegrown businesses that turn into employers and jobs. And the, the last strategy you see here is really a third pathway around um, how do we help people upskill who are in current career trajectory employment opportunities, right? So in your larger sectors, public sectors, healthcare sectors, um, large employers, there are career pathways built in. And what are the opportunities to help people in sort of entry levels obtain the credentials and skills while they're working to move up and inside? It's actually good job retention. It's useful and it gives people creative pathways forward. You'll see inside there, there's three pathways to this skill development, right? There's skills inside our dominant travel and tourism industry. There's let's create new entrepreneurial job development. And the third is we've got some large employers who we can sort of help support and highlight programs that help people gain the skills to advance their career, tra career trajectories within those. So again, you see a set of action steps, ideas, that this team is prepared to work on and put into play um, in the very near t term. Um, I'm going to pivot next to a conversation about how all this comes together in, in a group here in a second. So I just want to put one comment in about what comes next. And uh, Sue and, and Kevin are going to pick this up after our panel discussion. But the example you got from Susan in Greenville and that we saw in other site visits is that um, we have the chance now, you have the chance in this community to take full ownership of these ideas and to take the first steps. Um, this roadmap will both be a guide and obsolete within two years because you're going to keep learning as you do the work. And you'll have tried some of these strategies and they'll have gone nowhere, but you'll have found four new ones. And that's the idea. We have to commit to it. Um, I love sort of the adolescent, the 13 to 18 year old analogy, I think is apt for where we are and sort of how do we stay at it and keep ourselves moving forward. And that's the commitment we're gonna ask for you next. And to make that work, um, we've got five folks who've agreed to, and all they've agreed to do <laughs> is to be the person who gathers the next version of a working group around each of these five goals so that we can push the conversation forward in each of these areas. In a little while, you're gonna get a chance to go talk to them, say, I'm in if you wanna be in on that working group or I wanna be informed. But first, we wanna hear from those folks about why these issues, why they're important to them and what they're excited about. So I'm gonna call them up here. While they're coming up, here's what I'd like you to do. I'd like you to turn to your neighbor and talk amongst yourselves in twos and threes. What are you excited about and what you see in this roadmap, and what do you see as possibilities for our future? So have a short conversation with your neighbor while we get set up up front. Panel? Okay. Thank you for that. I hope I jump-started your thinking and your conversation. We're gonna cruise on through here to make sure we stay on track. Um, so with us up here on stage, quick introductions. Um, 
John Balthus is here, president of the Silver Dollar City Foundation. He's representing Bradley Hershend. Bradley's going to take the lead on the work, but John, raise your hand, say hi to everybody. Um, Dr. Brian Braun is here, principal of Branson Junior High School. He's going to take leadership on the life skills and job training working group. Um, Heather Hardinger from the Taney County Partnership is going to take the lead on workforce um, and jobs creation. Uh, Jonas Argus is here to substitute. Heather couldn't be with us this morning, but we appreciate Jonas stepping in this morning. Thank you. Susan Flores is here from OCAC, Taney County Neighborhood Center, to talk with us about housing, and she's agreed to sort of help pull the housing conversation together. And Brandon Williams is here from the Taney County Commissioner and as owner of a local business who experiences these challenges um, to help us jumpstart and keep the conversation going about transportation. So that's who's with us today, and I appreciate everybody, not just for stepping up on the panel for a few minutes, but really for the ongoing work you and others are gonna do. Um, I've asked each of them to talk just a little bit about why this issue, why they see it as important in the context of this work, and what they hope comes next. And we'll go briefly around, and then you'll get another chance to ask questions about the roadmap or about what you've heard the panel say the same way we did before. So with that, I'm gonna let John go first. Uh, for me, it was really very simple, and it's been touched on already. The bigger picture is that this is not a battle about flesh and blood. This is a spiritual battle. And once you step into that realm, you can put everything else in perspective. If we can approach everything we're doing and recognize that the solutions aren't gonna come from us, but they're gonna come from God, and obviously he has a calling on this community. Sue talked about it. You look back in our history of 06, 07, 45, Guy Howard, all of those people, what was ultimately he was doing is planting those seeds here, and those seeds are bearing fruit today, and we all get to be a part of the bearing of that right now. We'll see that fruit, because that's been his plan all along. Our nation is at a point where this is important, that we do our part right, and ultimately, you can see that that, quote, 8 million people that come here will be coming in for a very different reason, and we all get to be a part of that. Number two, there's already a lot of very good work being done. We're not trying to reinvent the wheel, but we recognize as a caring community, if anybody of you have interacted with the folks in this community that are in the ministry or in churches, you know they have Christ's heart. And all we're wanting to do is realign that so that we effectively can be more aligned with that heart, and then collectively we all do better together. That's common, no complication of what that. What personally, uh, my wife and I have uh, seven kids, five of them are adopted, one from Seoul, Korea, one from uh, San Jose, Costa Rica, and three biracial kids. So I can tell you the poverty they came out of was nothing compared to what it is here. It's much more difficult in the environment they were in. So when you see it from that perspective and you understand it at that level, it works on your heart and it will make a difference in lives and think that was God's plan all along. So that's it. Thanks, John. Dr. Braun. Yes, I think this is a great opportunity. And just for me to personally be involved, I'm just a grateful um, to Dr. Brad Swaff, our superintendent, who's a member of the chair uh, steering committee, uh, for asking me to be involved. But just personally, I, as an educator, principal at the Branson Junior High, uh, got to use some quotes here along the way as a former uh, American history teacher in the classroom. But I just believe fundamentally that every person uh, has inherent value. And this community embraces uh, those beliefs from a faith-based perspective. Uh, and every person should be in our community should have the opportunity to be welcomed and valued. And uh, JFK, John F. Kennedy has a quote, he says, um, not everybody has equal talent, but everybody should have an equal opportunity to develop their talent. And I think we're also recognizing in our community as John just shared, not everybody has equal circumstances, but everybody should have an equal opportunity to work from their circumstances. And as a public educator, working with educators of all kinds of backgrounds, we should be able to, on the front end, with our young people, our children that we so value, the treasure uh, in our lives so often, our young people, uh, Ben Franklin said, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. So the task force, I'm, the goal I'm working with on skills, a lot of it can be on the front end. And we should give kids a great opportunity, a great start. But also, if you have interest in working on skill development, we've got to be able to be a community that's redemptive as well. 
because there's the ideal, then there's the ordeal. And we've got to be able to come together for people from all ages, all walks of life, to have these equal opportunities, equitable opportunities to, to get out of their circumstances. Um, as President Reagan said, not everyone, uh, we can't help everyone, but we, everyone can help someone. And so if you're here and you're wondering, what, what's my next step as a call to action, you've got five goal groups here that you could jump in and join. And you may have a particular passion, a particular skill set, and we're going to ask you today to come visit with us, talk with us, get involved. You may not know what it is yet that you could do, but I hope, like me, you're a person of passion that cares about our community, uh, that you want to have five years from now, 20 years from now, that we can look back and say what we accomplished with God's help and energy and drive, we're gonna have a legacy that we made a difference with the time that we have. This is our time, let's make a difference now. Thank you, Dr. Barr. Um, Jonas. Yeah, so first of all, I wanna apologize because for me sitting in for Heather, you're getting the B team, if not the C team. Um, <laughs> Heather is on her way currently on a service trip to Puerto Rico and leading a team of uh, 16, 17 individuals to, to go down there and, and give back. Uh, our president and CEO, Jeff Seifert, believes that he's leading that team, but it's actually Heather, so that, that can give you uh, some indication of her strengths. Um, Heather's in the trenches on a daily basis of workforce development, and you know, at the 40,000 foot level, it's uh, talent development retention and attractions. So she works with employers looking to fill jobs. She looks. She works with individuals that are looking for work. Uh, so she has a, a broad and deep understanding of all the challenges of jobs and sustainable wages in this community. So uh, Heather's a very passionate young professional. Uh, she uh, is very, very passionate about equity and, and uh, equity and um, um, I just went blank. Oh my gosh, equity and inclusion. It's Friday, it's been a long week. Um, so I think she is gonna do very well in this, in this role to, to help the community to educate and, and to drive some initiatives that, that have been um, identified in this program. Um, there, there's, there's a lot out there. Um, so just a little bit on how, how all this has come together um, with with Heather is that you know the the, num the amount of job openings in this community far exceed the amount of people that we have to fill them, and we've learned that through our employer studies and and other and other avenues. So that's how we ended up going to recruit um, at the point at that point in time seasonal help from Puerto Rico. Um, so, but then we brought those folks from Puerto Rico. Then that really highlighted the challenges of housing. So that led to the led to the housing study, um, which is also identified in, 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 the, in, the, in the plan. So, um, you know, the, the, the economics of the issues are what they are, right? So because of the, the success and the development of the Branson market, it, it makes it impossible to build the type of housing units that, that are needed for the demographic. Maybe that's, I think that's, the, that's, that's really the crux of, of what the workforce challenge is. And so, uh, again, if, if you're interested in, in, in jumping on board with that effort, uh, Izzy Martinez, another member of our team, will be uh, in the other room after the presentation to, to visit with you. So, thanks. Thanks, Jonas. Susan. Hey, I am so inspired by listening to Susan today and just so happy to be here and involved in this process. Um, I feel very blessed and fortunate to live in this area. Um, just a little bit about myself. Um, I moved to the Branson area 20 years ago to attend College of the Ozarks and have stayed. I have three kids and we've built a life here. My parents live here. My husband's family lives here and we are, we're not going anywhere. We're very committed. Um, I have a psychology and social work background and I've worked in Taney and Stone Counties for about the past 12 years. I've been on all the back roads. You know, I'm, I'm very uh, familiar with this area. And I've primarily worked with low-income residents and have really seen firsthand the impact uh, of poverty on our most vulnerable residents. 
Um, I've seen how housing instability is a catalyst for other forms of instability in their lives, and I've seen their lives spiral due to not having basic needs met. I've been with them through crisis after crisis and have felt homeless at times, and I've also been able to rejoice with them when they succeed. So I feel very fortunate to now work for an organization like OCAC that so values community involvement, and I know that that's a really big thing that we're trying to work on right now is the collaboration of all of us working together. Um, just with all the various nonprofits, churches, businesses, other organizations that we can work together and combat poverty. Um, of course, OCAC receives government funding each year to help with rent assistance and also manages the Section 8 program to help families be able to afford housing. Of course, while these programs are great, government funding is limited and wait lists can sometimes be long. More solutions are needed. I, I can tell you right now, our Section 8 wait list is two years. So it's, it's really, um, and when people come in to fill out the applications, they're just already, you know, um, depressed, thinking they're going to have to wait that long to find some help. Um, I feel so encouraged and excited to be a part of the steering committee and work with such wonderful people that I continue to learn from and grown with. These are truly wonderful people in this community that care and have amazing talents. Um, just kind of a, a personal story that happened recently. Um, I participated in the point in time count headed up by Catholic Charities, but mainly carried out in Taney County by Elevate Branson. We loaded up in vans and went out to seek the homeless in the area, find their camps, and offer assistance. Walking down in the woods into these camps was such a humbling experience for me. Elevate Branson was able to recruit some of the homeless to help us find these camps and talk to those that we found. Uh, while driving in the van, I was able to listen to their stories and also spent a lot of time talking with Carla from Elevate Branson, who has a good understanding of this issue. And I've learned much from her, and I look forward to getting to know her better. After that day, I asked God to use me somehow. Especially with our rising homeless population, I wanted to be a part of the solution, and I believe that's why I'm here today. Um, from our efforts, I hope that many things happen. I hope that we can... Um, so a couple practical things, can find um, support for the Salvation Army. You know, when it's, when it's really cold outside, the Salvation Army is the only place for the homeless to go to. And right now, Captain Linda has two consistent volunteers because people have to remain awake um, for the entire evening to ensure safety and all of that. So um, if y'all would love to volunteer for that, I'm sure she would love to talk to you. And then also, I know that Elevate Branson, right now, they're working on an effort to provide 45 units on their property, and I think they're going to be coming to the community at some point um, asking for help there, too. Um, I hope that agencies, churches, businesses, we can all work together in a more collaborative way. Um, we need more shelters tra and transitional housing for those that are working towards housing stability. We need better access to more affordable housing and decrease the need for families to live in extended stay hotels. We need a specific plan in place where agencies are ready to mobilize and work together and offer support when extended stay hotels are shut down suddenly due to unsafe conditions like what just happened recently. We need to ensure that families also have support services while they're working towards housing stability and continue those services as long as they're needed. And we need true community awareness. Um, I love this quote from Maya Angelou. You know, do the best you can until you know better. And then when you know better, do better. I think that this is such a, a, a great big step in more community awareness. And once I think we all see, I think there's so many people that really want to help, they don't necessarily know how, or don't necessarily maybe see um, how drastic the issue is. And I think that once we all really see that we'll act. So, um, some of my thoughts as to why, why you should join a group. Um, this community is filled with caring, talented, and passionate people. If you feel that your specific calling and talents can be used in a particular committee, then join. This is truly a community effort, and we need all hands on deck. Many times in my life, I've felt ill-equipped and have been tempted to keep telling myself that I can't really make a difference, the problem is too big. But I think that can be such a good place to be in because we realize that we must rely on God and ask each other for help. I'm so excited for this next phase and can't wait to see what our community will do. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Susan, very much.
Um, one more to go. Brandon, you're up. Transportation. I feel like we're at a music competition. We're all competing for <laughs> your guys' to join our team. So, uh, so, so yeah, my name is Brandon Williams, uh, commissioner for Taney County, and uh, then also a business older, owner here in town and, and building another store north of town. So kind of have a dual uh, perspective on transportation and the importance of transportation. So at the county level, you know, we have a lot of challenges when it comes to the terrain, the cartography, and the topography of the county itself. Uh, so it's, it's expensive for us to build roads. We can't go through mountains. We have to use, uh, a lot of the roads that we use are roads that have been around for 70, 80, 100 years. They're old goat trails. Fruit Farm Road, for example, was literally fruit farms, and that's where the wagons went through. And, and so now the challenge is widening those roads. And, and so uh, there's a lot of challenges with that, just the, the infrastructure and uh, coming up with uh, new routes that are going to make it easier for, for people to be able to get to work and uh, easier for the housing, easier for a lot of these things. Uh, the one benefit that we do have at the county is we have a sales tax specifically for road and bridges. So in the county itself, that's a huge blessing. Uh, and and, and it, it really makes a huge difference in our community, uh, specific to Taney County. So at the, you know, the more micro level, when it comes to my private life, uh, we own, uh, again, a couple businesses, and, and then I'm also doing some uh, remodeling at my own home. And I've had some guys working out there uh, for about a year and a half now on doing some uh, mason work. And it never fails that somebody's cars broke down, somebody can't get to work, uh, somebody else has to go pick up somebody else. It's always, and, and a lot of it's their own fault, and a lot of it's no fault of their own. And so, you know, those are some serious challenges that I'm sure every business owner, every manager, every uh, individual here that relies on other people to get to work, and then those people who rely on those jobs to support their families and support their own kids, uh, it, it's a very serious issue that you wouldn't think would be that hard to uh, come up with a solution for, but it's a very challenging uh, thing to come up with a solution for, so specific to transportation. Uh, you know, kind of like I said, a, a personal story. One of the guys had a car, wasn't uh, licensed properly, car was taken away, uh, but he had within the time frame of the, of the uh, title. And so the point of that is, is even just education on how to make sure you're license and your car and everything's properly done is is huge in this community I, I don't again don't know how many people are involved in that specifically but we deal with it quite a bit with our employees uh, both personal and and business so I'm sure others do as well so um, excited to kind of see how we can work together to come up with some solutions for these problems for, for not just the, the transportation aspect but for all these and uh, work towards having a better community so thank you Thank you. Thanks to everybody on the panel. We've got just a few minutes. If you've got questions about these issues, we're back to the same entry point. If you go back to your mentee, you'll see a new question about, um, do you have questions about the roadmap or for the panel? So I'll pull from those. While some of those are coming in, I'm going to actually put you on the spot first, Brandon. Um, because we heard a good bit about it from Greenville, too. As, a, as an elected official, when you think about the, the role for local government of all types in the challenges of helping people move out of poverty, um, what are the opportunities you see for the role in the public sector, and what do you think we're going to have to sort of be careful to, to navigate in the public sector as we do this work? So <clears throat> that is put me on the spot. Thank you. <laughs> You know, government's role, in my opinion, is one to be providing, again, the infrastructure and the tools and everything necessary for the, the people and the churches and the different communities and our uh, civic organizations to, uh, to be able to flourish and to be able to provide the solutions. Um, you know, specific to, one thing I will say is, is I feel like the city and the county and, and uh, you know, the chamber, I, I feel like we do all have a very good rep, uh, relationship. I feel that, uh, you know, here specific again to Taney County that, you know, we're all a lot on the same boards. We see each other on a regular basis. We go to a lot of the same meetings. And I think that's very important to, to move forward with any um, 
initiative or anything that's important to the community is because we, in one way or another, we all serve the same people. And so um, being invited to be a part of this is, uh, is important. So, you know, I think just the willingness of, of every elected official in every capacity is, uh, is probably one of the most important things. So one of the questions about what does it mean to join a working group and how much time is involved, et cetera. So I'm gonna tackle that one. Um, it's gonna be up to you and the group. So the, they're called working groups on purpose. Th they have work to do. Um, they're gonna be trying to reach out to people, find people, involve people, um, carry issues forward. But each group will shape and adjust as it needs to. If you're interested and committed and prepared to meet once a month, or on some sort of similar frequency for an hour or two with folks who are working on the same issue, that's the starting point. These folks are gonna sort of take names and agree to organize a conversation and to start to put a roadmap together to get things moving. Um, I can tell you that often working groups in these kinds of um, conversations often divide into smaller sort of little teams and three or four people will take off and go work on one thing and three or four people take off and go work on and they'll come back together in a month or two and see how everybody made progress. Um, so the, you locally will get to sort of shape that in the ways you want to do that and the steering committee will keep things connected but um, it, it doesn't have to be a huge amount of time um, and you get to gauge that and, and one of the questions about involvement of students um, I, I think we would strongly encourage students to find their way into these conversations. As important residents and workers and participants in this community, your voice on these working groups in this, in this effort is gonna be really important. So that's the simplest and easy way. Um, does anybody wanna to add to that, your expectations, what you're hoping for? You're all good with that, okay. <laughs> well, I'll say, I really like what you're saying about break likelihood of breaking up into smaller groups because that's as I've kind of thought through this I think that would be the best way for this to actually work because then you're not having one person or a couple of people trying to do it all mm -hmm. you know it's really more of a collaborative effort yeah. I'll just I shouldn't speak for Heather because that'll get me in real big trouble but I've been around her to know enough that that she wants all ages She's very um, keen to uh, the perspectives of, of young people, uh, students. Um, she launched a student survey last year to get the perspective of, of kids in our high school and the challenges that they're dealing with uh, in life and, and in their education and, and future work uh, endeavors. So um, with Heather's group, but the key there is work. So you, you will work. Uh, I promise you that, and you will identify results and have a plan to get to those results. Um, you know, she, she's very driven, very passionate, strong woman of faith, and so um, if you're looking to get into it and do something, um, I guess this is the competitive part of me coming out. <laughs> You, you, you need to go see Izzy uh, after this. And, the and, recruiter. And, yeah, <laughs> and get involved because uh, I think, I think if, if you're not aware uh, of, of, of the, the, the workforce challenges and, and the many complexities within that, um, I think once you get, get in tuned a little bit, you'll see that there's a lot of places to, to, to get, get engaged and, and, and really make a difference. So. so I want to pick up off of those comments because one of the other questions that's come in is around awareness building. And what would you all, as folks who've been involved or getting involved, staying involved, how do we increase awareness building about issues in the community? And what would your suggestions be for folks around sort of building awareness around um, the, the challenges of community needs in this region? And what would you encourage folks to do? Well, I think it starts right here today. This is a great group of people that are collected here. And by the way, in the name of, of uh, collaborating and embracing our rivals, uh, the uh, employability skills development first meeting is Wednesday, March 11th <laughs> from 3 to, 3 to 5 p.m. at the Branson Chamber of Commerce Community Room A if you're interested in joining. You can see me more outside here. But seriously, I think just word of mouth, once we have uh, so many people of goodwill just joining in on these groups and people just talking about the high level of energy uh, across Stone and Taney County about what's taking place uh, and then the steering committee bringing feedback in to make a cohesive communication of, of good things that are happening to, and to making aware I can see our own video like Greenville has of, of, it, it's gonna happen 
you know, God's behind this. Uh, the people of goodwill and this community are going to get to see uh, it happen. So, but I think it starts. It's already started, but it, the really next step is the people in this room that cared enough to come today to to also get the word out and start joining these groups. I think so. Working in the chambers, so we we have the economic development side, the chamber side, and the CVB side. So there, I I have to feel like there there's a a certain amount of apprehension or fear to, uh, for lack of a better term, show our warts because of the 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 importance of the tourism economy and 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 not to to scare visitors and 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 make them not want to come here. To be honest with you, but um, to to you know we have an internal saying that we own our mistakes. Right, um, and so as a community, we have to own our mistakes and our issues, and and not be intimidated or afraid to speak about them openly and address them in a manner that that it's okay. Right, it it, it is what it is. We own our issues, and and that's the way you know we're only going to be able to take steps to address them. So I, th I think being very open and honest and. And, and you know, communicative about the, the things that are going on, and, and engaging more people and educating them to, to what it what it is, I think would go a long way. Um, did you want to add, John? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, never go wrong with transparency. Uh, regardless, you have to get the right out, right message to the right audience. That's a given. I'm a fan of storytelling. And what I mean by that is when you tell a story about a life changed, you touch a heart. When you touch a heart, you touch many hearts. So that methodology to me is taking root, and I really believe it's not necessarily just who you reach, but that message crosses all of us, and it has the impact that all of us has. And I think just us being intentional to tell stories, uh, I think is going to also be another way of expanding people's awareness of what's going on in the community. So John, while you have the microphone, I'm going to sort of maybe give you a chance to go first on this one. Others may want to chime in. But there have been a couple questions about what is it really going to take to mobilize and expand church networks um, to um, connect and serve, especially out into the rural areas more is one of the issues. You know, it, one of the things when you look around the community, there are some of our ministries that already have extensive church partners. Uh, CAM has existing caring people, uh, love in the name of Christ. Uh, Elevate Branson, they already have trusting relationships uh, with multiple ones. United Prayer is another one in our community. At minimum, they already have 25 church partners and at the high end, 40 church partners. So to me, it's leverage. If you can tap into those that already have trust relationships with churches and you get those five to the table, you probably now have 125 churches that you have access to. So I would absolutely start with leverage and get that already communicating with people they already know. Anybody else want to add to that? I think that part of this is the power of the partnerships. Like when I think of the churches, I think of, you know, how many Christians the body of Christ like work in our schools throughout Stone and Taney County. So you have public school and schools of all type throughout our counties that they're right there out and they know people in the rural areas too. So it's just a matter of who are you, where are you at, and what can you do, what's your role uh, to help move people forward? So we just don't even have to just think about, you know, the institution, but the institutions are scattered throughout their positions during the week, and how can their groups get involved in this too? So, you go ahead, Jim. So, um, you know, at the end of the day, this isn't going to require funding to get a lot of these um, outputs from what we do. So I just say that because, you know, we, um, faith requires works, and sometimes works cost significant amount, amounts of money. So that, that is going to be an issue that, that needs to be addressed, uh, that needs to be tackled. Um, you know, I've had the privilege to go on several chamber leadership visits throughout the country, and we actually did go to Greenville and got to experience that. And, and so um, what, what some of these other communities have that have addressed a lot of issues is, is a much broader and deeper, um, you know, pool of resources in corporate and generational wealth uh, that we may not be as, as fortunate to have, but that doesn't mean we can't do it. But we have to have individuals and organizations step up, get their checkbooks out, and fund some of these initiatives once we have a plan of action to address them. So. 
Yeah, so now everybody's going to run for the exits because somebody just asked for your checkbook. No, sorry. Um, so I want to real quick, there have been a couple of versions of different kinds of questions that are very detailed about particular goal areas. And I want to encourage you with those level of interest in those to go find the folks in the next room afterwards because we're not going to have time to, to get to all of these. For example, several of you have asked about, because it strikes you as curious that biking shows up in a transportation goal for bike share because it's not the flattest spot in the country, right? Um, and I probably would have said that too, except we actually have hard data from a pilot program at Elevate Branson of how much the bikes got used by residents in the motels to get to and from basic things. It's not a solution comprehensive, but it is part of a solution to one of the dynamics of transportation. And that's the trick with all of these. All of these are really big things, and they will take lots of different pieces assembled together to respond to the different dimensions of the problem. So you see the bike sharing on the list because it's part of a response to a larger problem, and it grows out of something really concrete that we actually have some hard data around both how much it could use and how much it costs to run it. So that's the practice we're after with all these groups. Let's try stuff. Let's collect data. Let's learn. Let's figure out how to put things into practice. So again, there are, I've probably got a dozen questions of, for each of these groups that fit things like that. I encourage you to sort of go pick somebody's brain and find out a little bit more about those. Um, I want to ask one more question for folks to sort of who might want to respond around, which is sort of the role and responsibility or possibility of participation from sort of more of the larger private sector, um, even middle and small business owners in this conversation, and that are there enough of them in the conversation, and what's the outreach, and what are the possibilities for how we bring more local businesses into the conversation? Anybody want to try and work from that? Well, I think any employer uh, within the region of, of Stone and Taney County, if, if, if if they're not experienced the challenges of, of, of just competing for people to fill the jobs they have, to um, be able to provide the customer service and put out the product or services that, that they're in business to do, um, you know, there, there are a handful that I would call our employers of choice that have figured out um, the balance between wages and benefits and uh, year-round uh, support, even if they are a seasonal business. Um, but you know, it's, 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 a tough, it's a tough challenge, right? The, 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 the seasonality of the tourism industry, which, which is the driver of this market, um, the, um, like I said, the, the supply and demand issue, um, everybody needs to get involved because you know, we had a had a, a meeting last night, and we talked about how things were 25, 30 years ago, and how certain individuals within the community were able to do things uh, and get things done and address issues. Um, well, this community isn't the same as it was 25, 30 years ago. And, and somebody that I admired very much, I had to ha have a you know a real moment and say, well, well, if if he was here today and had the same leadership qualities. I don't think some of these issues could be addressed with, that, with those methods that were used 25, 30 years ago. So the challenges are way more complex. Um, the businesses that don't realize that their future depends on sustainable solutions for, for workforce, especially tied to tourism because, um, you know, there's, there's, a, there's an idea or a movement that, you know, you know, two million more visitors. That would, be, that would be great, that would solve a lot of issues, but then that would also require more staff to provide the excellent customer service that as a community we're known to be able to give. And at the current rate of supply, we would fall short, right? And so the last thing we want to do is invite a bunch more people to come here and have a terrible experience and never come back. So if, if those businesses, especially that are directly in the tourism industry, don't realize that, they need to. And then the, all, all the ancillary businesses that, that are business to business, businesses, I'm saying business a lot, but they, they, <laughs> they, 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 their business depends on the success of the, of, the, of the companies that work directly with tourism. If they don't understand and realize what's going on, they need to because the current state is not sustainable, and I'm not trying to be a you know a gloom and doom kind of person here. But you know, as Susan said, we're we're competing globally, right? These aren't we're not these aren't issues just 
for Branson Tri Lakes area. Other communities twice our size, 10 times our size, are fighting for talent, are dealing with uh, inequality when it comes to wages, are dealing with housing issues. So we have our own issues, and they're, and they're you know, um, unique to us, but globally they're very similar to all these other places that are doing the same things. Thanks, Jonas. Um, any quick final comments from any panelists? Yeah, I just say at the beginning of the year, our superintendent, Dr. Swafford, mentioned his name earlier. He gave a keynote speech to our entire faculty and staff and the entire Branson schools, and he talked about hope. And he showed a slide that you can live 1,200,000 some seconds without food. That's about 14 days. And you can live 260,000 seconds without water. That's about three days. You can live 480 seconds without air, but you can't live one second without hope. And I think what this opportunity is about, and Jonas said it, it, it you know, believing that we can make a difference has to be followed up with by that people are not going to have to wait two years that there's going to be concrete actions that take place that people, that hope is that there is a sustainable job. There's also hope, as an initial member of our committee said, we need to be looking at the businesses as the final consumer who's going to benefit as well. So it's not just about moving people out of poverty. How are we going to help our local businesses? We've got to provide them skillful trained people there's something in this for all of us to be able to help it it's hope for business or hope for people to move but if if we're if we don't have concrete action steps but this is the opportunity this this is a a groundswell of momentum get involved because it's about ready to take off and we all can be a part of it thank you let's say thanks again to the panel thank you and, and thank you for all your questions and comments, it's fascinating. I've got over 50 again this time. And all of the incoming comments will be handed off to the steering committee so folks have all of it. Um, but I can tell you if you read through this list that just came in, you would have defined the complexity of this challenge, right? From all sorts of different dimensions that you're thinking about as you yourself build your own awareness and learning around this. And that's both a challenge and an opportunity in the space. So the final word I wanna say is, Keep learning, building, and growing, but don't let it stop you from acting. In too many communities that I get to work in, people start to hear how big the problem is and they start to imagine there's nothing we can do. It's too big, it's too expensive, it takes too many things to do. Um, and that's where we slow down and sort of get stuck. Um, we've got to recognize how big it is. We've got to keep asking the questions that help us understand the complexity. And at the same time, we've got to go figure out how to, like, let's take a couple months off the wait list. Let's, let's do something to chunk away at these problems while we keep learning about and attacking the complexity of the problem. So I am thrilled and excited and look forward to watching what comes next. With that, I'm going to invite Sue Head and Kevin Huddleston to the stage. You're done. We have some friends here from one of our state offices that are going to give a recognition to our own Elizabeth Hughes. Good morning. We are from the Department of Health and Senior Services, and I am Sarah Davenport. From, I am the chief at the Office of Rural Health and Primary Care. This is Misty Dennis. She is our Rural Health Coordinator in the Office of Rural Health and Primary Care, and we are here to recognize Elizabeth Hughes, who is our Rural Health Champion for 2019. And what I'd like to do right now is have Misty read the, nom the nomination for Elizabeth. Mm -hmm. 
Oh, don't touch that. <laughs> okay, the Tandy County Health Department nominates Elizabeth Hughes, former director of uh, Christian Action Ministries, CAM, for the 2019 Rural Health Champion Individual Award. Elizabeth championed health for rural, underserved Tandy County residents as director of Christian Action Ministries for the better part of three years until her departure in 2019. She responded to the needs of underserved populations across Tandy and Stone Counties in a number of ways. Elizabeth championed new community-wide fundraisers like the Festival of Trees, a Christmas event where trees sponsored by local organizations are sold back to the community. Proceeds enabled CAM to significantly increase their ability to, to deliver more than 1 million pounds of food to more than 42,000 Tanny County residents in need. Elizabeth also empowered the community to collectively define and alleviate the root causes of poverty and poor health in Stone and Tanny Counties through a large Missouri Foundation for, for Health Grant Funded Poverty Research Project. This project has brought cross-sector partners to the table on poverty in ways that this community has never seen, seen to accomplish collective goals that benefit everyone while targeting those most in need. Elizabeth Hughes possesses the true qualities of a leader and is the best fit for the Rural Health Champion Award. Her passion is helping and empowering the residents of Tanny and Stone Counties, not only led to the, to the development and increased success of Christian Action Ministries, she inspired other individuals and organizations to do more and be better alongside her. Attuned to where gentle words or firm hands were needed most, she and her organization shepherded those in need out of crisis and those in power to the table to help. Elizabeth Hughes, please come up. It is with great honor that I present this award to Elizabeth Hughes. Thank you very much for your service. We appreciate all the work that she has done in helping us decrease health disparities and increase health equity, and it is with great pleasure that we provide this award to her. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, I'm going to move this mic. First of all, I want to say, following Elizabeth as director at Christian Action Ministries, she has made it very, very easy for me to following her footsteps. Um, none of this today would be possible without Elizabeth's vision and her extraordinary drive. And so that's made it easy. I will, I will also say it's made it very, very difficult because I'm not gifted the same way that Elizabeth is. She is an extraordinary person, as we all know. And so I always comment about her tiny little feet and my big clodhoppers, but my, I, my feet don't fill her shoes. Um, so it's made it very difficult to follow her because of her extraordinary talents. But this community has been exceedingly well blessed to have somebody like Elizabeth Hughes to serve us and to serve as a role model to us as we try to carry her vision for a better community forward, a community that um, is helping people move out of the, uh, the area of poverty and move into being a more productive component of our community and being a more cohesive part of our community. So um, speaking on behalf of myself personally for Christian Action Ministries and for our community, um, Elizabeth, we miss you very much. Uh, we wish you were available to us yet, but uh, you're now our gift to East Tennessee. But thank you very much.
Are we going on to the next phase? Or I'm so sorry, I didn't realize what we were doing. In that vein, um, Elizabeth's vision was to create this Stone and Taney County's Poverty Initiative um, going back better than two years ago. It was her passion. Somehow in coming to Christian Action Ministries, she recognized that the model that we were following in trying to help people was not a sustainable model. We can't continue to give things to people and expect them to exit poverty because we're able to supply them with a few days supply of food or we might be able to supply them from one of our other ministries in town with some housing or transportation or what have you. You can't give that away. You can't, you can't, it's not sustainable. We have to attack the problem at its source. So while she was exceedingly busy turning the prospects of Christian Action Ministries around and getting it on a solid financial footing, and doing that by also implementing a very successful but time-consuming Festival of Trees project for a fundraiser for that organization, she took on a third initiative, which was the Stone and Taney County Poverty Initiative. The people you see on this panel today, multiplied by about five more, have been working on this with Elizabeth and now with me for a period of two years. We are just now to that kicking off point where we can say, we've gathered the data, we know what the problem is, now where do we go? So we've stuck one stake in the ground over here that says this is where we are. We know where we are. We have a community of people who care, but we also have, within our community, we have a group of people who have felt disenfranchised and left behind not appreciated, feeling unwelcomed, um, not particularly engaged in our community, and at times even exploited by portions of our community. And we recognize we can't continue in that. So we've got that stake in the ground. Then we put a stake in the ground out here that says this is where we think we need to be going, a, a community that is more inclusive, a community that's willing to work together and bring people into the family rather than kind of pushing them to the periphery and saying this, this is our community, you can, you're, you're okay to join it if you will, but you have to do it our way. So now we're learning, that, sorry, that there is a different way, a more cohesive way. So how do we get from this point to that point? It's not going to be a linear path. It's not going to be a straight line. It's going to be a very curvy, Ozarkian road to get there. Sometimes a broken road. But we are going to get there. This is Elizabeth's vision that she has shared with us. So we've got these five challenge areas that these folks represented here today quickly repeating them, motivating a caring community. How do, how do we get people out of their seats, people who truly care about their neighbors, but sometimes don't understand what that avenue to assistance is? How do, how do we motivate them to come say, I'll do that, just, just kind of point me in the right direction and I'll do that. And then we have jobs and sustainable employment. We have plenty of jobs in this community but most of the jobs are not intended to be filled by primary breadwinners of a family. Um, affordable housing. Uh, again, we have some forms of housing, but people are not intended to raise families in a converted motel room or a dilapidated uh, shack out in the community somewhere. Um, reliable transportation. If you don't have a car in this community and don't have the funds it takes to keep that car repaired and gasoline in it, there is no transportation for you in this community. We need to correct that. 
Um, skills. Sorry? Skills. skills. The life skills that people need, whether it be the basic skills of learning what it takes to get into a job or what it takes to step up in a job. Um, we have some, some initiatives in that area. We need to make that much more prevalent, and much more available to folks. And we also ran into people, particularly outside of the immediate Branson area, who don't really recognize that there is a path for them out of the poverty that they live in. Um, they don't recognize that those skills are available to learn because they think it's not for them. Um, anyway, the, the, the point is, there are avenues for us to move in. We just are having a problem trying to figure out how to get to that point. So this is the kickoff point. Um, what we are proposing now to get from this stake over here to that stake over there is what we're calling the three-legged stool. And that those three legs are, first of all, it's the backbone organization of the collective impact model. And we're throwing some jargon out at you that if you don't know what the collective impact model is now or what a backbone organization is, you will in short order. This is, this is the direction that we're moving. But the backbone organization is that central hub of data gathering and information sharing that we need to paint the picture vividly and objectively as to where this stake is and where that stake is and how we're going to get there. And then this backbone organization serves as the, the central hub that serves the other two legs. The first leg is going to be a more collective and collaborative, uh, for lack of a better term, we'll, we'll borrow a term from Greenville, United Ministry. I don't know exactly what form that's going to take. I don't know if we're, going, if we're really talking about formal merging of ministries and service agencies or some form of a confederation and information sharing. But we know we have to be more collaborative in one fashion or another. That discussion is going on right now as we speak. So it won't be this ministry working over here and this agency working over here dealing with the exact same clientele but not communicating with one another. We do to an extent now today, I don't want to paint it black and white, but we need to enhance that collaboration. Um, the word collaboration has really popped up in my conversation a lot over the last six months or so. The third leg of the stool is carrying that same concept into not just the, the program area, but the funding area. And again, borrowing a term from Greenville, they have what they call the Greenville Philanthrop Philanthropy Partnership. And so the idea there is you also bring the funders together in a more collaborative approach, and they get to share not just their financial resources with the community, but they get to pool their collective uh, intellectual equity, their institutional knowledge, their social equity and bring that to bear collectively to the community. So now you've got the three legs of the stool. You've got the backbone organization providing the, the information and data that we need. You've got the collective efforts of the ministries and programs, and you've got the collective efforts of the funders. Those three together make a strong cord for us to use to pull people in, in one direction, and we all need to be then pulling in that direction. Recently, I came across, a, uh, we're gonna talk about books again. I came across another book by a fellow by the name of David Brooks. I don't know if you know David Brooks or not. He's a columnist with the New York Times of all places, uh, but he's kind of their conservative voice, if there is one at the New York Times. Um, a few years ago, David Brooks uh, had a crisis period in his life, and it, it ended in divorce and losing his family. Um, his career kind of went sideways for a while. 
But a friend of his directed him toward a small group that he thought could help. And David kind of thought it over and said, yeah, I guess I'll go to that group. And this small group led David on a journey over the next five years, which culminated in David, who was raised as a, as a Jew, raised in, in the Jewish faith. David converted to Christianity. And as part of that transition, David realized that he had been chasing the wrong thing his whole life. And he wrote this book that was called Second Mountain. And the way David described it was he'd been climbing this mountain all of his life, the first mountain, which was a mountain of success. He called it the mountain of resume virtues. So he was building this mountain of going to the right schools and developing the right skill set and getting the, the right set of experiences in the workplace and developing this network of contacts and people that he could, he could draw from, which really is, is what your resume is, right? Your education, your training, your, your experience, uh, your references. So he built this resume mountain and what he found out is he should have been climbing the second mountain, which is relational. It's not about what you did or what you can do. It's about who you are and who you share that with. So he called that second mountain, he, he called it the legacy virtues. These are the virtues that people are going to read about in your obituary. Um, the relationships that you've built, the things that you've done with people. And what's occurred to me now is What's true for an individual, as in David Brooks' case, is true for us as a community. Branson has been very fortunate that we've climbed and are climbing the mountain of success. This is a very highly successful community, and I'm convinced that our greatest days are yet ahead of us. But success is not what it's about. We're not a community just out of happenstance or because of a accidental geographical collection. That's not what makes us a community. A community is how we relate to one another. That is the root word of community, communing with one another. And so if we're going to be a community, we have to be a community for everybody. And we have to climb that second mountain. We've climbed the mountain of success, now it's time to climb the mountain of relationships and the legacy virtues. And that, again, is the vision that Elizabeth has laid before us. So we thank you for that, Elizabeth. None of this would be possible without you. Um, it's more difficult without you. But we thank you for laying that legacy for us. Thank you very much. Okay, as we're about to wrap up, I'm gonna adjust this. I'm so sorry, I apologize. That was great. Okay, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Don't get near it. <laughs> oh gosh, I did it. So sorry, so sorry. So none of these issues we've talked about today really are any surprise to us. It's just that now we have some data to support it. So I think one of our takeaways from Susan is the data is going to help us drive the conversation. And the three-legged stool that you're looking at are also going to give us the framework that we need, I believe, to really move things forward. And there are pieces within each of those legs already the conversations have begun to make that a reality. So very excited about that. I want to ask you, you may be tempted because of the scope of our issue to hear a story like Greenville and immediately say, 65,000 people, I mean, all that resources, they have manufacturing. You could, you could go ahead and just discount everything that we could possibly learn. And we just don't have time for that, y'all. 
We have to dig out what can we use. Waco, Texas uses collective impact also, and as do other communities around the country, of various sizes in various types of projects. So when you're tempted to do that, I'm just asking you, please don't, because really it's gonna take some collective will of the people in this room, not just the people that do it every day, serving those in need, working tirelessly, and many of you are in this room. But it's gonna take more help from the rest of us to come around them and to do more. So we have to use this new approach, and it is going to require something from each of us. This little visual aid, some students helped me, thank you so much, and staff members. There are uh, about 741 of us in the room today, and there are that many pieces of fabric, but we wove them together to symbolize those three strands that are not easily broken. Susan's right, nobody's going to come and do this for us. No one cares as much about our area as we do. And so we, can't, we have to be stronger and better together in this. So I'm going to ask you to do, well, I want to share one thing with you real quickly. A couple weeks ago, I was having a conversation with the Lord about this. And I was praying, enumerating all of the ways that we're working so hard. And this is what I felt he said to me. I'm not trying to put words in his mouth, but it was the message that I received. You tell me that you love me. And you tell me that you love my word. You tell me that you want to love others better. You keep telling me that you want to be a better wife and mother and sister, and daughter, and friend. You keep telling me all these things. Just show me. Show me that you love me. Show me that you can love others better. Show me that you love me. That's our chance, y'all. When we look into the faces that are, of people that are hard to help, he called us to do exactly that. We can keep talking all we want, but he just says, show me. This is our chance, and this is our moment. If this resonates with you, then join us today, right now. So you've got some various ways to do it. We have five different groups that just need people. You may not have the expertise in that area, but right now, if you're being stirred to work in one of those areas, then take your card that says, I wanna do something to help and take it to that table in the back room. We want to add you to the work. Over the next weeks and months, we'll work on getting the legs of the stools in place. Some are already coming together, quite remarkably, actually. And I want to invite you, oh, here's my little clicker. I'll try not to touch the microphone. Okay. Along these lines, a member of our community, I was recounting to her what we learned in Greenville and this model of the three-legged stool, and I noticed she was smiling the whole time. I was, she kept smiling at me, and I thought, well, that's so nice. I hope you're on board with us. And she said, no, 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 I've got a book for you. And so she said, and I'm going to give it to you. She had a stack of them. Some of you in this room may have already received this book from this person. Um, so. Another friend in the community said, hey, she had been part um, of a community in Durango, Colorado, where they actually did a community book study. So here's your chance. This book, Rooting for Rivals, talks about the, how collaboration and generosity increase the impact of leaders, charities, and churches, and I believe communities. Rooting for rivals has to do with how do we go from competing with one another to collaborating with one another. 
And how do we go from a scarcity mentality to an abundance mentality? Because here's the truth. If the Lord wants this to happen, we have an abundance of help and resources. I really believe that. While the legs of the stool are getting in place, we're going to challenge everyone in our community to read this book. And if you would like to do that, I believe you have a card or there's a way in the back for you to sign up for that. Apparently, it's free on Amazon Prime. Um, If you can't afford this book, we will get one for you. We're going to do this reading. If you read the book, and there there are a few discussion questions after each um, chapter. By the way, it's the same authors that wrote uh, Mission Drift, if you've read that book. Excellent book. Um, The administration here at the college read that, and President Davis actually restructured our administration because of that book. This book is full of golden nuggets and great insights, especially for people of faith. Um, If you will read the book and participate with at least one other person in discussing the discussion questions, then you will be invited to an evening with one of the authors sometime this summer. Rooting for Rivals, I believe, is going to set the stage for us to change our thinking on how we approach the work that needs to be done. So... I would like to ask that you, gosh, I'm so sorry, I just didn't mean to do that. Um, the next thing that you can do is if you would like to join one of the work groups, I believe you have a card that says you can put your information, and you could go back to the Silver Dollar City, we're going to exit this way here in just a moment, and you can take it to the table, One of uh, there will be a representative in their well-marked tables, to express your interest, okay? I want to tell you two quick stories since John Baltus reminds us that stories are powerful. Last year, we showed a video of my mother-in-law, Jane Head. You may have remembered she was the doodle queen, and she doodled on white paper bags, mm, white paper bags like this until she passed away in October because she wanted the children that receive meals from Elevate Branson to have something bright in their day. And maybe it would encourage them to start doodling too, she would say. She did bag after bag after bag. Yesterday in the mail, so she did her one thing, a ministry of one. Yesterday in the mail, I received, my husband and I received um, a gift from a young woman that we know who's recently been diagnosed as paranoid schizophrenic. Um, And when we opened the bag, she gave us each a stocking cap because as part of her dealing with her illness, um, she's learning how to knit. Just a ministry of one. She's just doing her one thing. If you're interested in helping in some ways, I'm just going to give you a few ideas to get you started. Might you consider being a mentor at Jobs for Life or sorting groceries in the back room at CAM? Would you consider donating an old car to the Garage Ministries so that our friend Andy can repair that car to, um, to help someone in need? who needs to get to work. All he needs is cars. You get a tax deduction. It's just one thing that you can do. Maybe it's the single parent who just needs a break. Could you be that safe person to watch their kids one night a month, one afternoon a month? Could it be coming to any of the ministries and agencies who I'm sure would love your help to say, what can I do to lighten your load? I'm with you. I'm with you. Remember, all he says to us is, show me. Show me that you love me. We can do this. We can. And we have exciting things today. So let's take our cue from Elizabeth Hughes, a person, a mighty person of one, whose determination said, we're going to have to attack this problem because we can't be having the same conversation 10 years from now, right? 
So here's your chance. Please sign up to do a book. We'll also have a table back there just if you want to volunteer and you don't even know what your gifts are. That's okay. That's just an I'm available. My hands are open. Use me, Lord. And we're going to be sending out further ideas and a database we'll develop of volunteer opportunities. And go see one of the folks who's passionate about these five different areas. Not going to happen overnight. We're going to make lots of mistakes. We have got a, some gasoline put on the fire by Greenville's willingness to help us with whatever they have. So it's a real blessing in that way. I appreciate the time that you gave today to be here. Um, and I'm looking forward to seeing what's going to happen in our community. But remember, he says, show me that you love me. So now is the time. Thank you for being here today. We're going to exit out this way to the left and in the Silver Dollar City Parlor. Sign up opportunities, but there's also cake to celebrate Elizabeth. Thanks for being here today.